Um, this joint work with uh, uh, Navneet Agarwal and Sanat Anand, who were undergraduate students at IIT Bombay. Uh, so I'm talking about MPC, or Secure Multi-Party Computation. So let me just start by reminding you the setting. So there are a bunch of parties. They, get, they all have inputs. And they may all want to compute some function, so they could all potentially get outputs. And to compute this function on their inputs, they run a protocol. They talk to each other. And the requirement is that they should learn nothing other than you know, their own inputs and the outputs of the function. Right? So whatever else they see in the protocol could have been simulated. It's a very fundamental model. You know, uh, since the 80s, uh, we have uh, cryptographers have been working on this. We know a lot about it. And you know, one of the foundational questions, the fundamental questions in, uh, about MPC is which functions admit secure multi-party computation protocols? And you'd think that by now we should know everything about it. Unfortunately, even in the most basic uh, in a setting for this problem, things are wide open. So what do I mean by the most basic setting? Uh, information theoretic security with no restrictions on number of parties who are corrupted. We do, of course, know a lot of very important, uh, you know, powerful positive results when you do put restrictions. But I would think that you know, this would be the most basic problem if, uh, if not for, if, you know, if you didn't if, um, have all those positive results, this the first thing you would think of. We know a little bit for the setting of two-party functions, deterministic two-party functions. We do have a full characterization of what's possible and what's not. And in this work, we are interested in you know, uh, more than two parties. Right? And we'll study mostly uh, in this talk, I'll talk about passive security, so the honest but curious adversary setting. And we do have results on UC security also, which I'll mention towards the end. So um, to understand the uh, you know, uh, feasibility question for MPC, we also in this work introduced some minimal or simple models of uh, MPC for aggregating functionality. So what do we mean by aggregating functionalities? All, there's just one party who has output, the aggregator, and all the other parties have inputs, and they don't have any outputs. Okay. Um, so simple models of MPC for this, uh, these kind of aggregating functionalities have been around for a while. And one of the most influential works in this setting is um, by Feige, Killian, and Naur from the 90s, who introduced the private simultaneous messages model. So in this model, all the input players send a single message to the output player. And you know, it has to compute the output. But we also want security. So for that, they allow a trusted party, a coordinator, who can a priori send some uh, co correlated randomness to the parties. They also require security only when, uh, I mean, only against the corruption of the output party, so none of the input parties can be corrupted. More recently, uh, Amos and uh, his co-authors uh, introduced another model uh, called NIMPC, where they do allow all parties to be corrupt. Any subset of parties could be corrupt. Um, but they uh, make another restriction on, the, uh, uh, in, on security, namely the adversary is allowed to learn not just the output of the function, but the residual input, re the residual function um, of the inputs of the honest place. That is to say, the adversary is allowed to learn the output of the function on all possible settings of its own inputs, of the corrupt party's inputs with the uh, inputs of the honest players fixed. Okay? So you can evaluate the function on um, you know, keep the honest players' inputs fixed and run through all possible uh, inputs of the corrupt players. So that is allowed in the ideal world. That's given as legitimate information. And in either of these models, we understand feasibility fully. In fact, every function can be securely computed under these, uh, in these models. So these models are not so much, uh, f uh, you know, trying to learn about feasibility question. It's about uh, asking questions like uh, computational complexity of these problems. Right? In our case, we are interested in the feasibility question of MPC. So what we introduce uh, is a new model called, uh, you know, we do, of course, talk about MPC, but we also introduce a new model called unassisted NIMPC, or UNIMPC. So how does it work? It's like NIMPC, but we don't have the coordinator. And also, we don't allow the output party, the star in the output party have removed it, to say that the output party is not allowed to learn the residual function. So it's just like an MPC protocol. 
But we do allow two-phase computation. So there's a first phase before the inputs come in, where the input players can talk to each other. And then there is a phase when the inputs come in, they just send a single message to the output player. Okay? So that is unassisted in IMPC. Our most minimal model is what we call UNIMPC star, where in the pre-input phase model, uh, of in pre-input phase, the parties send a single message to each other over you know, private channels. Right? So it's a single message, and then they get the inputs, then they send a single message to the output player. So that's our basic model. So why, you know, why are these models relevant to the study of feasibility question in MPC? If you show an UNIMPC star protocol, it's automatically a UNIMPC protocol, which is automatically an MPC protocol. So the security notion and the communication pattern, everything here uh, is consistent with on the corruption model. It's all what is allowed in MPC. Right? So a protocol that's secure in either of these models is also an MPC protocol. OK, so now let me um, actually show you the results we have before you know, uh, I explain them. So this is a landscape in the sense uh, you know, every point here is supposed to be a function of functionality. And uh, we have these three sets, right? The set of functionalities which have MPC protocols, and some subset of them have UNIMPC, and some subset have UNIMPC star protocols. We don't fully understand what these sets are, right? Even after our work, you know, it's, we don't fully understand. What we can tell you is the following. There is a class which we'll define you know, in a combinatorial or algebraic way, um, a class of functions called CPS. So I'll describe what CPS is in a bit. And all MPC protocols live inside this class. All, MP all functionalities with MPC protocols live inside this class. And on the other hand, we can sandwich all these classes you know, within, or we have another class, uh, the CPSS, which also I'll describe in a second. It's also defined combinatorially or algebraically. And we show that the C class of CPSS uh, functionalities do actually have UNIMPC star protocols. Right? So the gap is between these two things. There's an you know, extra S that's, uh, that's confounding S. And um, so let me first tell you about these two results. And we have a few more things in the paper which I'll mention towards the end. OK, so but first I should tell you what CPS and CPSS are. These are names we came up with. Uh, you know, if you have seen these things elsewhere, I'd be happy to know. Uh, they're very natural objects. I just don't know, you know, uh, I don't know any standard name for these things. So what is an NMCPS? A CPS stands for a Commuting Permutations System. So you should think of N as the size of the output alphabet and functions we will be describing. So N is some, uh, you know, uh, 1 to N are the possible outputs of some function. And each of these x1 to xm are the input sets of m players. And what each input is is actually just a permutation of these n numbers, right? So or, you know, each element in the input set, each element in xi, is a permutation on these n elements. So just put it another way, xi is a subset of the group of all permutations. That's called the symmetric group, Sn. Um, and it's OK. So far, there is nothing commuting about it. Permutations don't usually commute. The commuting part is the following. Suppose I took m permutations, one from each of these sets, and I applied it to, um, and I applied it to 1. Okay, 1 is some designated special element in the output set. So I can apply you know, uh, one after the other these m permutations on 1. I'll get some other number in the range 1 to n. That number should be the same even if I applied these permutations in a different order. Okay, so the row is some permutation of these m permutations. So I apply them in a different order. I mean, just to illustrate, so pi 1, pi 2, pi 3 are three permutations. They are colored differently because they are coming from different sets, x1, x2, x3. And you apply them to 1. It's the same thing as if you applied them in a different order. Okay? And in any of these six orders you apply them, you'll get the same thing. That, that's what the definition of a commuting permutation is. So it's very simple. Uh, just to point out, the commutativity is required only across the sets xi, and also only for applications to that one value, 1. Right? So as permutations, they may not commute with each other. But when applied to this one value, the order doesn't matter. Okay? So that is the definition. And 
I'll explain, hopefully it'll make a little more sense uh, soon, but let me go ahead and explain, um, oh, by the way, so CPS is not a function, right? it's a system, uh, it's a bunch of permutations. The function that we associate with the CPS is the following, just the inputs correspond, to inputs are these M permutations, one from each set, so one from each party, and the function, the output of the function is just evaluate those uh, M inputs on one, okay, that is a, that's a function associated with the CPS. And CPSS is just an extra requirement, so there's a subgroup system, which means each of these XIs was a, is, should be actually a subgroup of the symmetry group. So symmetry group you know, is a group, there is a group structure with uh, composition as a group operation, and these sets should be all subgroups of this set. Okay, so that is a requirement of CPSS. Okay, so where does the CPS thing come from, right? So let me explain. It's actually, uh, I think, fairly intuitive. So suppose somebody gave you a function, an aggregating function f, and they said it has an MPC protocol, you know, information theoretically secure against uh, passive corruption. Then um, let's consider a partition of this set of M players into two parts. So one part consists of just the output player, which I'm calling P0 there, and one of the input players, PI. Okay? And the other set is the remaining set of parties. Now think of this as a two-party setting now between uh, the set R and the output players. So it's not easy to, it's not hard to see that, you know, to, if you have a secure protocol, the only thing you can effectively do is the set of parties R, they're not supposed to learn anything other than their own inputs. So they have to just send, off, send out their residual function to the other two players, okay? So that they can evaluate their function correctly. And, you know, so that is, a, you know, if you have a secure protocol, or if you, uh, yeah, if you, have, secu or if you have any protocol in which R doesn't learn anything, then this is the only way it can work. Okay? But on the other hand, it's also a secure protocol where these two parties, P0, PI, should learn nothing. What that means is this residual function that they have to learn is something they could have learned just from the output of the function. In, you know, so without, uh, just by learning, uh, you know, with PI's input, uh, fixed input pi i, you know, whatever they can learn um, about the input players, inputs of the part set R is all that they should learn even if they learn the residual function. Okay, so the residual function is nothing more than what the input and output reveals to the uh, set P0, P1, PI. Okay. And CPS captures exactly this condition. It's, it, does, it may not look, that, look like that immediately, but if you play with it a little bit, you'll see that CPS is exactly capturing the condition that the residual function is for free, in the sense that it's already implied by just one, inp you know, one input for PI and uh, the output corresponding to that. Okay. Up to relabeling of inputs, uh, you know, and outputs. And one direction is very easy to see. Suppose I give you a CPS, then it, in, it indeed is the case that, um, you know, so if you consider um, the function uh, applied on pi 1 to pi m, by commutativity I could just apply pi i at the end. So I apply all the other uh, permutations first, so I'm calling it pi r, the composition of those things. And so the function is actually just pi i composed, I mean, applied to pi r of 1. So pi r of 1 is all the information that you need to evaluate this function on any input, on uh, pi i uh, in particular. So that is the residual function, pi r of 1, okay? And uh, if I give you pi i of pi r of 1, since pi i is a permutation, I can compute pi r of 1. Okay? So at least, you know, it's very easy to see that if I give you a CPS, it does, catch, it does have this property that residual function is for free. Uh, and the other way, you know, is, uh, is something you can prove. You need to kind of go over things and uh, ensure. Okay, so that also works out. So that's one way to think of what CPS is doing. It is that condition. Um, there's another way we could look at it. Um, there's a class we didn't give a name in the paper, so I'm just calling it NIMPC without leakage. So remember, in NIMPC, the output party was allowed to get the leakage, the residual function. So you could imagine a model where everything else is as in an IMPC, I just remove this condition, okay? 
And then actually, CPS is an exact characterization of which functions are securely realizable and not, which functions are not. I mean, it is a characterization of which functions are realizable in this model. Okay? And I'll also mention one connection with another recent work of uh, Halevi et al. from last year's TCC. Uh, they defined a notion called best possible information theoretic MPC, which you know, I don't have time to go into right now. Uh, okay, but uh, actually, uh, the definition is actually very simple. It's the same as this NIMPC with the leakage allowed to the aggregator, but you just remove the trusted coordinator. Okay, so in our case, we kept the, in this slide, we are keeping the trusted coordinator, remove the leakage. If you do the other one, you get this um, bit MPC. Um, so the reason I mention is I'll show the connection here. Um, so to remind you, you know, this is um, our landscape, um, which I have not yet proven anything to you. I just defined CPS and CPSS. And we can all actually show that these things are, there is a gap. Okay, so it's a, these are two combinatorial classes. We can show there are functions which are CPSS, and they are not CPS. In fact, they do not embed into any CPS. And the thing about bit MPC is that Inside CPS, the residual function is for free. So there is no distinction between MPC and bit MPC in that gap, okay? Uh, inside CPS, rather. So if there is a gap between CPS and MPC, that means that's also a gap, that's also a set of functions which do not have bit MPC protocols. We don't know if this gap exists or not, um, but it's an open problem whether bit MPC is possible for all functions or not. If this gap exists, then it is not. OK, so now let me um, tell you about CPSS. Why is it inside this UNIMPC star? Okay, so that is actually a protocol. Um, so we are going to give a UNIMPC star protocol. And I think it's kind of a cute protocol which generalizes this very natural and simple uh, protocol for summation that you might have all seen. Um, so let me uh, tell you what the protocol is. So suppose uh, this is your function uh, defined in terms of M subgroups of uh, SN, of the symmetric group. Okay. And so, suppose there are three parties, right? So M equal to three. And before getting their input, they are going to talk to each other a little bit. So here's what they will do. So each party P1, P, so in this case P1, picks three um, elements in the groups G1, G2, and G3, okay, one each. So that's a color, that, that they're colored differently. And the condition, I mean, they're picked randomly subject to uh, the one is a fixed point of their composition. So if you apply these permutations to one, you can apply in whatever order, that doesn't matter. But you apply to one, you'll get back one once you apply all three of them. Okay? So, so P1 picks such permutations in its head, and each of these guys, P2, P3, they do that uh, independently. And then they have not communicated yet. What they will do is just send, uh, so all the group one permutations are sent to P1, group two permutations are sent to P2, group three permutations are sent to P3. That's uh, all the communication they do before the input comes in. And then they get their inputs, pi one, pi two, pi three. They do a secret sharing as follows. And uh, they compute, you put, they compute uh, these additional, uh, you know, sigma one zero, and so, so P1 computes sigma 1, 0, such that if you compose all of them together, you'll get pi i. And why is this possible? Because it's a group. The, the, uh, pot, you know, uh, the blue things all live in a, in a subgroup of SN. So you'll be able to find this. And they send, each of them computes this and sends it to the aggregator, the output party, who does something somewhat strange. It takes these permutations and applies them to 1. Okay, and outputs whatever comes out. Okay, so let me at least tell you why it's correct. Why it's the correct thing? The correct thing would have been the following, right? What you would really com like to compute is pi one up to pi m applied to one, where each pi i is the composition of the sigma i's in a sigmas in a row. So this is what you would have liked to do: compose all these, you know, sigmas in the bottom row. That'll give you pi one. Then compose them with these and so forth, and apply all of them to one. This is what you would like to do. What our protocol does is this a somewhat strange thing. It just applied these things to one. 
Okay, so let's try to make sense of it. We, ha we know a little bit about how these other things look. Right? They all keep one as a fixed point. So uh, at least we can do this. Instead of you know, saying the uh, application was you know, oblivious of the other shares, you can at least write it this way. Okay? But still, uh, they don't look the same. So let me just show you that they are actually the same because of this commuting permutations condition. So I'm just going to focus on um, uh, these two uh, sets of uh, columns for now. Okay, so the order in which you are starting off is applying them in this order. That's the order in which they are written. And what you can do is you can bubble this green thing from here all the way up to here, relying on the fact that when applied to one, Right. When applied to one, the order doesn't matter. So you can bubble up that green thing all the way to the other green thing. And then, since they live in a subgroup, you can put them together. And you can kind of do this and you know, uh, bubble up things appropriately. And you'll get this other order, which is, if you notice, the same as first do these two, then compose with these two, then compose with these two. Within the group, you don't change the order, but Across the groups, you can change, move them around. Okay, and you, you can work this out, and it, you, know, you can do it more uh, cleanly. Um, it works out. And it can also be shown to be secure. OK, so that is all about the passive security. Let me spend just a couple of slides on or one slide on UC security. So UC security, you might have, you know, there's a myth, or uh, you might have heard that there's very little you can do, right, if you do not have any setups. Uh, there's virtually nothing you can do, uh, no interesting functions you can do. But that is for two parties. If you go beyond two parties, there are interesting functions you can do. Well, there are some limitations. You can only do either aggregating functions like we are talking about, or they're kind of a dual disseminating functions where one party has input and all the other parties have output. Okay? And you might have seen uh, you know, broadcast with about is possible in, uh, there is a UC secure protocol, it was observed by Goldosser and Lindell. And, and you also, there are also some other uh, special cases for disseminated functions that have shown up. Our first um, result here is that actually every disseminated function has a UC secure protocol, okay? not just these few. So that is about disseminated functions. How about aggregated functions? Well, there are aggregating functions. There, our protocol doesn't work for all of CPSs uh, to get UC security, but it works for something called complete CPSs. Complete means it's like a Latin square, or a, you know, where every party has n inputs, where n is uh, so every party has n permutations, where n is a number is output alphabet size, right? Um, and it's not just that functions which are complete CPS, even functions which embed into a complete CPS function, the CPSs can uh, do a UC security protocol. And that requires, uh, you know, for UC security, it's, you need to show that uh, if you restrict the domain to a subset, you can still get UC security. So there's a protocol, there's a new protocol needed to get that. Let me just finish off by this one thing. So UC security is a nice notion. You think of it as a very strong security. But it has a, some idiosyncrasies. Um, it doesn't always imply security against passive corruption. Okay? So we go ahead and define, and I know people have, you know, there's a, it's a folklore notion, I guess, but we, I don't think it has a name, so we just call it strong security. So strong, strongly secure protocol is one which is UC secure and secure against passive corruption simultaneously. And what we, from whatever I said, and a few little observations, what you can say is that we pretty much know which functions have strong MPC at this point. All disseminating functions have. Um, aggregating functions, which are, you know, we have a necessary and a sufficient condition, but they are not the same condition. And um, otherwise, if it's not uh, disseminating or aggregating, it's not possible. So the gap that is left is, CPS functions, which are not complete CPS. OK, so to conclude, um, you know, we have this new algebraic structures. If you look at the paper, you'll find a few more things. You'll find you know, some cute examples, some open problems on, um, you know, about the, uh, these algebraic structures. And also, we, of course, gave connections to all these uh, new models of computation, as well as MPC itself, the standard model itself. 
And, um, but, you know, this, at the end of it, all of this, still the full characterization, exact characterization remains open for uh, the standard MPC model and even for the, some of the new models we have. All right, so that's all. Thanks. We have time for one short question. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again.